Carved into the southeast shoulder of Mount St Helens is a deep and narrow gorge, the name of which is derived from a shocking encounter which was reported to have taken place there in July of 1924. A true struggle between man and beast which would end up becoming known as the Battle of Eight Canyon. The writings of the Native American tribes which originate from the northwestern states, such as the Clallam and Cowlitz, contain references to a strange and secretive race. This largely undocumented tribe was referred to by its neighbours as the Siatic, whose people possessed bizarre and supernatural abilities, and were so alien and unusual in appearance that all the other indigenous societies would go out of their way to avoid risking any contact with them. Siatic warriors were said to stand between 7 and 8 feet tall, their bodies covered in an unnaturally thick layer of hair, giving them the appearance of possessing a form of animal hide. It was said that these ungodly beings had the ability to hypnotize those they encountered, placing charms and spells upon both human beings and animals alike. Some stories even suggested that the Siatic were capable of killing merely by willing the idea of death into the mind of their victim. Most testimony pertaining to this secretive race agreed that they were largely a nocturnal species, electing to dwell deep inside the sheltered mountain caves and fissures during the hours of daylight, only venturing out into the wilderness to hunt and forage after dark. They would steal into the encampments and villages of those who had settled the region, taking whatever dried meat and fish they could lay their hands on, and in some cases abducting any unfortunate womenfolk they encountered. A summary of the various fantastic powers and abilities attributed to the Siatic makes for somewhat lengthy reading. In addition to being able to communicate with one another telepathically, these monstrous entities could also throw their voices imitating any animal found in the forest. They possessed a superhuman sense of smell, making them superb trackers, and their ability to camouflage themselves within their natural environment made them formidable opponents. Over time, many of the tribes native to the Washington and Oregon areas grew to believe that the reclusive Siatic had finally become extinct. Encounters with and sightings of the giant humanoids dried up completely, but on occasion, a hunting party would sometimes happen across sets of gigantic footprints, crisscrossing the borders of their territory. With the dawn of the 20th century bringing far more tangible threats for the native tribes to contend with, the legend of the Siatic eventually died away. But as settlers continued to push deeper and deeper into the traditional hunting grounds of the indigenous tribes of North America, they would sometimes find that the legends of the people they were encroaching upon had a worrying tendency to push back. The town of Kelso in Washington State had always possessed something of a notorious reputation. Serving as a hub for the numerous communities of miners and loggers who plied their trade in the surrounding area, its overabundance of brothels and other licensed premises would eventually earn the isolated rural settlement the unenviable nickname of Little Chicago. It was in the early hours of Saturday the 12th of July 1924 that a bedraggled band of gold prospectors stumbled into one of Kelso's numerous taverns describing to other patrons how they had just barely survived an encounter with a race of what they referred to as mountain devils. 
As the morning progressed, the small crowd of onlookers which had assembled to listen to the group's story steadily grew in size, eventually attracting the attention of a pair of State Park employees, J. H. Huffman and Bill Welsh. The two park rangers listened with interest as the five dirty and dishevelled newcomers paused between drinks to relate their fantastic and terrifying tale. They noted how both the band's leader, Marion Smith, and his son Roy were the most subdued of the bunch. Of the remainder, Gabe Lefevre and John Peterson were slightly more outgoing, but it was the one named Fred Beck who was doing most of the talking. Beck explained at length, pausing for occasional clarification and support from his colleagues, how the group had spent the last couple of weeks scouring the local foothills for potential seams of gold. Operating from a cabin they had recently thrown up a short distance from the Lewis River, the men had initially been quite productive, until they had suddenly been overcome by an overpowering feeling that they were being surveilled by an unseen force. As the treasure hunters had gone about their business, they had begun to notice signs that they were not alone. Mysterious tracks were found on the muddy ground near the cabin, some of which were up to 14 inches in length and possessed four stubby toes. The men also began to catch glimpses of a large animal moving in the depths of the forest, which they estimated to be near seven feet tall and walking in an oddly bipedal, and humanoid manner. On the afternoon of Friday the 11th, the prospectors had eaten a late lunch, before heading up into the hills to pan for gold until the onset of darkness. They had only travelled a short distance, however, before their journey had taken a completely unanticipated and bewildering turn. As they had been moving along the base of the mountain, they came face to face with a group of grotesque entities, who had suddenly emerged from the shelter of a ravine which lay directly across their path. There were four of the creatures in total, which Fred Beck would describe as resembling huge gorillas, covered from head to toe in thick matted black fur, and estimating that they must have weighed around 400 pounds each time seemed to stand still as the two groups paused to regard one another. An eerie and smothering silence descended upon the scene, neither side moving a muscle, before one of the giants suddenly took a heavy stride forwards and bellowed a guttural and inhuman roar in the direction of the five men. Beck related how his companions had fallen backwards over themselves in sheer terror, and with the monster's savage cry echoing and reverberating off the rocky outcrop surrounding them, he had instinctively raised his rifle and fired shot after shot at the attacker. Eventually, the fourth successful hit that he scored knocked the advancing beast off its feet and sent it tumbling sideways down into the ravine it had emerged from. At this... The remaining trio of creatures also began to roar and scream, and the five prospectors fled the scene, only pausing some distance later when the inhuman howling and bellowing finally ceased. But the exhausted adventurers barely had time to catch their breath before they were again running for their lives, as numerous shadowy figures began to slowly emerge from the caves and fissures they had already passed. Having finally returned to the safety of their staging post, the men desperately set about reinforcing the cabin's door and windows, while simultaneously arming themselves with whatever tools or implements they could find. Mere moments after the last piece of wood had been nailed into place, the whole structure was suddenly shaken and rattled by a series of forceful external impacts. The heavy blows which repeatedly rained down from outside were accompanied by the now familiar howls of the creatures they had run from, now seeming to emanate from all around the building. It was not long before the first makeshift barricade buckled under this relentless assault, with one of the creatures attempting to haul itself inside 
through a gap it had created. In desperation, Roy Smith attempted to fend off the intruder with an axe, but found himself violently swatted to one side. Eventually, it was driven off with a pistol used by Roy's father, and the breach was successfully resecured. The group's attackers then seemed to change tact, and all the men could do was watch helplessly as a wide hole was smashed into the ceiling above them, before large rocks and boulders were being hurled into the cabin's interior. One of these projectiles struck Fred Beck on the back of his head, rendering him unconscious for a two-hour period. When he awoke, the assault was still going on, his companions crouching silently beside him, firing gunshots up through the hole in the roof whenever they detected movement. Finally, at the break of dawn, the incessant roaring and hammering coming from outside the building subsided. After what they considered to have been a suitable period of inactivity, the miners peeked outside to confirm that none of the mountain devils were lying in wait, before grabbing their personal possessions and running as fast as they could in the direction of Kelso. When their story had been told, it took little more than the offer of a few drinks for Huffman and Welsh to persuade Beck to lead them back up the mountain to where he claimed the incident had taken place. After several hours clambering over the ravine in question, the two rangers could find no trace of the monsters he had described, save for a few spent shell casings. But when Beck subsequently showed them what remained of the cabin, it was a very different story. The roof of the small shack was completely smashed in, the furniture inside was shattered and broken, and the room was littered with sizable rocks and boulders. The two men paused to take impressions and measurements of numerous mysterious footprints which surrounded the wrecked structure, before they all hurried back down the mountain the way they had come, with the sun slowly starting to descend behind them. The story was quickly picked up by both local and national media outlets, which dubbed the incident the Battle of Eight Canyon, and visitors from far and wide were soon flocking to the area, in the hopes of having an encounter of their own with the elusive mountain devils. There would be no further sightings of the creatures described by Fred Beck and his colleagues, but the tale they had told would remain firmly lodged in the public consciousness for many years to come. In the 1950s, an article in the Seattle Times claimed to have uncovered the truth behind the mysterious happening once and for all, when former members of the YMCA troop at nearby Camp Meehan claimed that they and the rest of their friends were the ones who had attacked the prospector's cabin. They stated that they had thrown rocks down onto the cabin roof from high above the neighbouring hillside, and that the drunken gold miners had mistaken their echoing whoops and catcalls for the roaring of angry Sasquatches. Despite this development, Fred Beck never wavered from his belief that his attackers had been something truly inhuman. Even when some of his detractors were able to replicate the tracks he had shown to the park rangers, simply by manipulating the knuckles and palm of their hands, he refused to accept that he and his fellow fortune seekers were the victims of an elaborate hoax. As time passed, Beck's views began to markedly differ from the others in his group. Whilst Marion and Roy Smith maintained that the creatures which had attacked them were savage beasts, whose cave must have been located close to their cabin, Beck believed they were in fact highly intelligent interdimensional beings. He would go on to publish articles and pamphlets linking Sasquatch sightings in the United States to those of Yetis in the Far East claiming these were coordinated global incursions by beings from a parallel universe. Although Bigfoot sightings have historically occurred all over North America, the Pacific Northwest appears to be a focal point for the phenomena, accounting for well over a third of these alleged encounters. 
and whilst most descriptions of these enormous cryptids are remarkably similar, opinions on where they came from are more varied. Nearly every indigenous tribe in the region tells stories of cannibalistic wild men who elected to dwell away from the rest of humanity high up in the peaks of the mountains. The natives believe that over time, these people somehow evolved into the animal-like entities their ancestors would occasionally encounter, now more monstrous in appearance than human. The existence of claw marks in some of the footprints associated with Sasquatch encounters leads some scientists to suggest that these creatures are more likely a surviving hominid previously thought extinct. There are similarities in the samples recovered from fossils found in the deserts of Africa, and it is theorised that the species may have crossed a land bridge as Pangaea separated, stubbornly enduring in more remote parts of the new North American continent. The alleged Battle of Ape Canyon is intriguingly not the only mystery associated with the area. In August 1963, a group of four mountaineers descending the same face of Mount St. Helens had stopped to take a rest at a geological feature known as Dog's Head. One of their number, Jim Carter, agreed to stop behind and take a picture of the rest of the group as they headed off again into the distance. After a while, the other three members of the group became concerned that Carter had not yet caught up with them. When they eventually made their way back up to where they had left their absent friend, there were clear signs in the snow that some kind of scuffle had taken place, along with the discarded box of camera film. The skiers then followed what appeared to be Carter's trail, which led off in an apparently random and uncoordinated route in a completely different direction to the one they had followed down the mountain. The tracks indicated that Carter had clearly been moving at some speed, executing jumps and turns which carried huge amounts of risk. Eventually, the marks left by his skis stopped next to a steep drop, and so the party reluctantly headed down into Kelso to seek help from the authorities. Despite two weeks of combing the canyon floor in the vicinity of the missing skier's tracks, much like the monster shot by Fred Beck there 40 years earlier, no remains were ever found. Whatever species attacked Fred Beck and his friends during the 1920s and chased Jim Carter to his death nearly half a century later has managed to elude all attempts to locate or identify it ever since. As we have already seen in previous episodes, the vast and diverse nature of the geography of the United States continues to produce mysteries and unexplained incidents which no amount of science and technology has yet managed to solve. Whether the giant hulking creatures referred to in these reports are the cursed ancestors of America's original inhabitants or a some elusive offshoot of mankind's evolutionary journey is unclear. Regardless, it remains apparent that they are not to be trifled with.